Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick with this week's Know Your Foe episode. Uh, looking forward to the game against the Seattle Seahawks on Sunday in Baltimore. And here to join me is Dan Goforth of Setting the Edge, the podcast in Seattle. Uh, Dan, how you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Good to talk to you, Ken. All right. Outstanding. Great to have you, Dan. Uh, really interested to hear about the Seattle Seahawks. I guess the first thing we need to talk about is this big trade this week. Not too many big deals at the trade deadline. The edge rushers from Washington, both uh, uh, making the uh, Ravens uh, fans go nuts with uh, the Ravens not you know, getting in, getting either of them. But uh, Leonard Williams, a really big move going to the Seahawks. Yeah, he really is. Um, so a USC guy. And uh, Pete stays in touch with all the USC guys, whether he had them and coached them when he was there or not. And um, he's a fit because they made a big change last year that didn't really work out. So they went to the three, four defense, right? And they run a bare front from time to time, which is just four down linemen. But um, typically it's only passing downs. Mm -hmm. And last year they tried to use kind of space eaters in the middle, and it didn't really work out very well. Um, Al Davis, uh, Brian Monet is the guy that's still on the team. Big 325, 330 plus pounders that are supposed to take on, you know, double teams and, and make space for linebackers. And it just didn't come together. Now, we didn't have Bobby, Bobby Wagner as a linebacker at the time. So that's, that's part of it. Um, this year, it's different. They've gone with a quicker, uh, faster in both respects, uh, violent hands, penetrating approach to a defense. And the first part of that was bringing in um, John Reed, who had been here before and had, in fact, his best year ever with the Seahawks. Well, um, there's no question that Leonard Williams is that mold of a defensive lineman. And where John, John Reed has been um, really playing nose to one tech, they expect Leonard Williams to play one tech to five tech. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it'll be a lot different than how um, Wink Martindale, the DC at, uh, for the Giants, was using Williams. And for that reason, there's a lot of expectation that he'll do well, even should do even better than he was doing with the Giants here. He, he would have been playing a lot of three, I think, with the Giants which I would think would really suit him because uh, they have uh, Dexter Lawrence, right? So so uh, it, it, Dexter Lawrence has been playing some incredible football, first of all, so commands a lot of doubles from the nose. But I would have thought that that um, Leonard Williams would have been really good from the as a you, you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one matchups from that three-tech spot. You know, I would have thought so too. Um, you know, we played them this year. And so the, the, the Seahawks staff got to see Williams play against us. And one of the things that I noticed in watching the, the, the video was that it really didn't pan out the way I thought it was going to. You know, we had our way with him. You know, that was the 11-sack game that the Seahawks had. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that they would actually put Geno under pressure more often, and they didn't. And, and I think it was because the expectation was less of that um, – that penetrating defensive interior defensive lineman approach to the process. Um, they only cut him loose some of the time. A lot of the time he was basically looking to make plays at the line of scrimmage rather than behind the line of scrimmage. And I thought that was a miss, a misuse for him. That's not his, how he had his best year. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump right in and talk about the offense a little bit uh, at quarterback. Obviously the Geno Smith uh, re-signed uh, was he resigned before this year or before last year, actually? Before this year. Mm -hmm. They finished the year and then signed him. What's he doing differently this year? Strengths, weaknesses? Take us through the Geno Smith story. It's an interesting story. Obviously, it's captivated the nation in terms of football. And um, so from the beginning, people have thought it all started at the beginning of the 2022 season. But if you go back and look at the three starts, that he had with Russell Wilson out in 2021, he was solid. They only won one of those two games. and he But he almost beat the Rams when he came in for that last quarter of the game when Russell got hurt. 
he was absolutely solid. And those stats never get mentioned. In fact, I was, um, I was tweeting about it back then going, why aren't people talking about this? So it made total sense to me that when he won the job at a training camp that in 2022, that he would do well. Um, I think that there is some video catch up for teams in, in the league. They're, they're kind of seeing what bothers them and what doesn't. And, but there's another piece to the puzzle for him. So he's had quite a few more turnovers in the first eight weeks, way more than he did last year. And he's had some kind of questionable um, decision-making. And that really has proven to be a big minus for him. And yet they continue to win. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the biggest cause of that's not Gino. Um, this is what we hear from everybody. On all of our broadcasts where the national analysts and, and color guys are on, they talk about how the other team is, is playing their third defense starting, uh, starting offensive lineup for their O-line. But what they never talk about is for the last three games, we've started our fifth starting offensive line lineup. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of last week's game, um, Jason Peters came in for a while. They signed him too. That was our 10th iteration of offensive lineup for yeah. our, for our O-line. And that's crazy. I, that, that's insane. That's 10th different starting lineup or 10th different used at any point during the game? Used at any point during the game. We are still at five. Mm -hmm. We are still at five different starting offensive lines. I'm trying to think if I could get the, that many permutations for this year's Ravens, but I don't think so. They've used three different left tackles. They've used a couple different guys at guard, including it for just a single play. They've used multiple guys at center, multiple guys at right guard, including relief series. And multiple guys at right tackle. So I think they have they have had certainly replacements at all five positions. I don't know if we could get the get quite get to ten, but the good news about the Ravens is they have their starters right now um, yeah. from that were expected from the beginning of the year. Well, and I think uh, it's showing in Lamar's play. Yeah, it, it it did in against Detroit, and you know we're talking here about about the Seahawks, but Lamar got provided the single best opportunity set. Uh, that he's had in a very long time, 42% ample time and space, uh, which I define differently, but it, since I score offensive line play, I have that on those 13, sorry. Yeah. 13 plays. He threw for 20 total yards this last week. So only four of 10 and allowed three sacks despite having a, a, a three second pocket. So that's just, it's an unbelievably bad performance. So uh, uh, we'll see, but the previous, the previous week, 22.4 yards per play under pressure. So that's, you know, that's remarkable. So anyway, it's been an interesting ride for Lamar anyway this year. Well, not unlike the, the rest of the season for them. And, and the Seahawks kind of have been in the same boat, some some big up and down swings. And and they started out in the hole, right? Their first game against the Rams was what happened. Mm -hmm. And they all said the same thing, coach and players. We were not ready for this game. Take us through that offensive line. You, you mentioned there's been some change there left to right. So the one con constant, which he's been replaced for a few plays, but for the most part has played um, every game, is um, Damian Lewis, the left guard. But our starting tackles got hurt in the first game, right? So Charles Cross and Abe Lucas got hurt in the first game. Cross has been back for a few games now. Abe Lucas is still not back. And they aren't talking about when they expect him back. But yet no surgeries, um, you know, nothing that they speak to of why somebody be out for seven games. So um, Jake Curran picked up What's the nature of the injury. Uh, they're talking about um, they're talking about a tendonitis issue. That's, okay. that's and I've only heard uh, them say uh, that uh, one. elbow tendonitis. No, or... It sounds like knee. OK, so um, but they will not clarify have mm -hmm. not and they of course they get plenty of questions about it so yeah. and i think they just keep expecting him to come back um so jake curran filled in for him for a while um stone Forsyth filled in for charles cross at left tackle um for a long time and was credible and then cross came back and they moved stone Forsyth to right tackle because curran was hit and miss with some injuries um so um, our, our, our starting center, Evan Brown, has been solid, better than Posick last year. And um, 
But then um, we missed a few snaps uh, at left guard, and our new rookie center, Oluolotimi, came in and played center, and they moved Brown to left guard, uh, picking up a few snaps for uh, Damian Lewis. So, and he played almost half a game, Oluolotimi did. And um, he looks good. I mean, he's a rookie and he's made a few mistakes, but he's not a turnstile at all. And he got to play against, you know, one of the best in the, in the business. He, he was playing against Miles Garrett and holding his own when, they, when they'd stunt. So um, right guard, we also have a rookie. So Anthony Bradford has been playing most of our snaps at right guard for the season. And um, I don't know that he won't take over as the starter going forward. He's, okay. he's learned a lot. It's been a real um, learning, had a lot of big learning moments, but he doesn't seem to make the same mistake twice. And he is a road grader. When it comes to the run game, he can move people. That's the one downside of this O-line. They have not come together as a unit to really – create great run blocking. And despite the fact that, you know, we have a, a running back that's considered top five or six in the league, and he's still doing pretty damn well in, you know, Ken Walker, the third. Mm -hmm. So uh, Charles Cross, somebody uh, teams are very excited about last year in the draft. It's Charles Cross, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, very excited about in the, in the draft last year. Uh, how has his pass blocking looked? He went through a learning process in 2022, no question about it, but got better as the season went on until the last three games. And then you could just tell college player trying to make the transition to the pros, right? You know, once you get past game 15, you played way more games in one season than you've ever played. And both of our, both of our rookie tackles that last year showed that they just showed up some wear down, making a few more, not, completely their mistakes that they didn't make all year. And I, I think it was one of the reasons they lost their playoff game. Well, Phil, the Ravens really don't have a single player who is a good backup left tackle. They will play Patrick McCary there if, if necessary. But um, I feel jealous at the, you know, having five guys maybe who can play tackle, if, particularly if you included Jason Peters in that group. Uh, that, that's a that's an embarrassment of riches. I was wondering if that if that was a uh, if there were talks of, of trading any of those at the trade deadline here. Probably not with Lucas's injury. Um, well, none of them are making a lot of money, right? Two of them are rookies, mm -hmm. and Stone Forsythe has never been more than a backup, and yet he's playing well. Jake Curran, the same thing, and Jason Peters. He came in, I think, on the 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 vet um, men. the vet minimum, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Peters would be a possibility to trade somebody like that. I guess it would if I don't know what year Forsyth is in now, but I remember he was a legitimate left tackle uh, developmental prospect when he's originally drafted, right. and now he probably is a is a pretty fine swing tackle backup at this point that that uh, a lot of teams would like to have. Well, because we've had pretty consistent starting tackle play, he hasn't gotten much opportunity to show out, and so you know what? It's all about what there is on video of your play. And if there's just not much game action that people can re refer to, to see if something might be a, a good option to trade for, they don't. And I, I think it's held him back. I think he probably would have had prospects for a trade had people had the chance to see him play, but they're getting it this year. He's played a lot. I think my point always about the left tackle position is the size and shape pool is so small and there's so little available in, in that any team ever wants to trade. If you're whole, if you're holding the cards like the Seahawks are at the trade deadline, you might, you're missing out on some draft capital if you don't make a trade like that. And and I don't I don't think that I mean, you know, it wouldn't be a lot, but I mean, I don't think it would be hard to get a sixth or maybe even a fifth for a player like Forsythe. Whereas you talk about what kind of a player you have to trade to even get a fifth round draft pick at other positions, it's it's it can be much more difficult, but. Big difference between trading from for, from offensive tackle and just about any other position. So true. And one of the issues for him is he is fourth year, mm -hmm. but since he's never been paid really well, he may have prospects to get signed by somebody, but the real question is who's going to see him as real value that they need to pay for. 
Yeah. And there's a high probability that the Seahawks will be the team that sees him as real value and they'll, re- they'll re-sign him, right? Uh, he, I, I'll tell you, he'd be one of the guys that I would love for the Ravens to go after as a backup left tackle. Um, it, it, it's, it's exactly the kind of player the Ravens need is a player who doesn't make a lot of money, who can, you know, take three years, 10 million or something. Um, he's, you know, he's not going to make 30 million. Uh, and I don't think there's a left tackle starting job out there for him. So the question is, is, is uh, who gives him a good backup deal? And maybe that's it. Well, and, and the other piece of the puzzle is, um, you know, people don't realize that the type of moves that the Seahawks made in the last two weeks, 10 days, to bring in vets for depth mm-hmm. in Frank Clark and and uh, Leonard Williams, Seahawk talk, the 12s are all saying, this is them buying into we can win. Mm-hmm. We, we, we can win in the playoffs. And so that would probably be the other reason that we weren't sellers at some level with some of our, as you say, a wealth of riches um, as the deadline came on. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the wide receiver core. That's certainly been one of the strengths of the team. Uh, Talk through that. So um, I love the matchup of uh, DK and DJ. I think that's going to be really fun. So now what you don't hear on most of the East Coast part of the process, we're hearing a little bit more West Coast, but not entirely. Most of it's just local. Is that DK has been hurt for most of the games this year. And he took a week off and came back last week, and he still looked flat. And it wasn't until after the game that we found out that he was violently ill Saturday night. Hmm. Um, You know, stomach bug. And so he, he, he had a decent game, but he didn't look like his dominating self. And he hasn't for most of the year because of uh, bad rib injuries. And then um, after the first two weeks of dealing with rib injuries, he added a, a hip injury. And so his, his week off really got, a, got him back to 100%. And then he was sick 12 hours before the start of the game and uh, last Sunday. And so... They say they expect him to be 100%, and I love that matchup for the, for the Seahawks. The rest of the Seahawks um, receivers, the wide receivers, are a real interesting piece because two of them are rookies, right? Uh, obviously, the league knows about the ever-underappreciated um, Tyler Lockett, and he mm-hmm. looks like Tyler Lockett again this year. He's great against zone, and he's great against man. He's good at getting open. And it's about his ability to use leverage and um, his his quickness to get open. And then, of course, versus zone, he's good at finding the soft spots and sitting down, and sh- you know, showing his QB his numbers. The other two guys, clearly everybody knows about Jackson Smith and Jigba, but he had a slow start this season. They really weren't targeting him that much, much less, you know, um, making that effort, much less him having the success that a lot of people expected from a first round wide receiver. Um, but uh, Jake Bobo is the other guy, the 499 guy out of UCLA mm-hmm. who um, he's, he's tall and he has great quickness and he's, he understands leverage. So those three guys are all about that. What we saw last week is Smith and Jigba with a uh, week before last with Smith and Jigba and last week was he really has kind of become Gino's go-to when on those third down throws. So a, a, a real possession receiver. Well, and, Bobo has over 11 yards per target this year. So I, I assume there might be a big play in there somewhere that's, uh, that's helped. That's only been 12 targets, but still that that's uh that's a very rare find. Uh, and uh, you know, pro- it, it probably indicates something because it's either a high catch rate or a high yards per, uh, per catch. He, so, uh, he has three three long run three long catches one for a touchdown, and he's good at, at using leverage. He's good at using you know his his size to kind of you know body off the 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 defenders that he goes against, and he's caught stuff over the shoulder. He's got stuff back shoulder. Um, you probably saw the play he had in the end zone for a second touchdown, career touchdown, which was him getting the second toe down as it rolled out of bounds. Hmm. And that was a great play. It just was. And it was awesome that they, they, you know, Pete was smart enough to get him to review it. And uh, they saw that he did get the toe down before it touched the, 
the sideline there in, in the end zone. Um, but he's he's really crafty. He's crafty like like Tyler is, and like like uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, nobody's ever going to say that about DK, right? Yep. He he's going to man you and or run by you, and um, he's getting better at the slants and the, uh, the 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 comebacks and the outs that he really didn't have that in his game as a rookie. Okay, the the Ravens this year have been incredibly simplistic in terms of packages, which is very unusual for me because I'm a defensive guy primarily. I look at that uh, and I want to see, I, I enjoy seeing a lot of different packages done, but they've they've started with a cover two shell most of the time. They played nickel about 85% of the time. They played base almost all of the rest and three total snaps of dime. Um, their, their nickel looks really all are the same, including two down linemen and two outside linebackers. So former teams with Martindale would have used two, three, or four outside linebackers at the same time on the field to get it, get into a real uh, a NASCAR race car look, as I call it. But they, they, uh, have been very specific in their, in their defense. And so far this year, it's been kind of an, I dare you where they'll sit back in a two deep zone a lot of the time and they'll match up. They'll do different things that, that, that actually create different coverage elements on either side of the field and whatnot, but they'll start out of a two deep shell. And there hasn't been anybody who's been able to throw deep on the Ravens. Um, and it, it just, it is a question. I mean, obviously Lockett is a threat in, in, in zone two and he can make linebackers pay and whatnot. But the question I would have is, is a player like Metcalf, do you think they'll still try and fit the square peg into the round hole and try and run him deep down the sidelines when the Ravens have the interception leader sitting back at, at one side of the field deep and uh, another guy, potentially Marcus Williams returning from injury or, or Daryl Worley, who's who played well in his, in his one game uh, uh, on, on the other side, or perhaps even Kyle Hamilton, Kyle Hamilton may move up to play nickel as well. Hamilton, one of my favorite players in that yeah. draft, yeah. just, I, I had higher expectations for him actually than he, that he was able to achieve as a rookie, but I still think he's oh he killed he's, he's it as a rookie talent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. Hey, and and the moving him to nickel was just a, a great move for him. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, they had to they had to put him back on the back end, but very effective playmaker from that nickel spot. Totally, it's almost like you're playing a defensive lineman there sometimes in terms of how he looks at the position, but he's very effective with his uh, length and size and. Uh, uh, trying to get quarterbacks to throw under, over that uh, him as an under the zone player and also the the downhill play he can make rushing the pass or all he does. Very, very Derwin James like. Yeah, no, no question. I, yeah, in my mind, in some ways better than Derwin James, actually. He, he has, he has an understanding of football that is unique, right? I don't know if it's, he's one of these guys that's been playing since he was seven, but he has a feel for the game yep. and it showed when he was in college. And, and he's really starting to shine in these last two years. Uh, I think he's, he's got a, an even higher ceiling. I think you're going to see great things. So the Seahawks DNA has been, in 2022 especially, to throw deep. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody saw a video on it to where this year defensive coordinators are going, okay, we're not going to let them throw deep. They'll have, to, they'll have to march it down the field to, 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 to get to – the red zone before we're going to give up the deep play. What's changed in 2023 is they are taking what the defenses are giving them, but they still are taking their shots. It's just not as frequent. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Gino proved last year that he's got the arm to make those deep throws that have to be in a bucket, right? They have to be perfect throws. And he hasn't have had as many of them this year, but he's he still had some, and what I think you'll ex, you can expect is uh, if DK sees single coverage, they'll probably take their shot. But I wouldn't be surprised if Bobo sees single coverage if they don't take some deep shots with mm-hmm. him. His his double move is solid, and you wouldn't think it would be for a guy that's that slow. But they know if he can get a good double move on single coverage to hit him in the first 15 to 18 and it'll be a big play because he's hard to bring down. He's, he's big and you know, he's coming in at 218. He's big enough to where smaller DBs are going to struggle with him. And he's good with a stiff arm. He's he, he, so, and then I think deep overs for Lockett, but we saw deep overs with Smith and Jigba in the last two games as well. 
Um, they only hit one of them that I can think of, but I know they'll run them. Um, and it seemed like to me, you guys are just devastating against tight ends this year. Is that right? Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to think here, but they, they've, they have all the characteristics to be good against tight ends because they've had good, strong safety play and they've had good linebacker coverage, which is really, that's new because yeah. Geno Smith had, had a lot of growing pains, uh, not Geno Smith, um, uh, Patrick Queen had a lot of, uh, uh, difficulty growing into the league. I want to talk about Jordan Brooks and, and some of their parallel development too, when I get to the defense. But uh, but yeah, I mean they've had pretty good pretty good coverage period. They've only allowed four point four yards per pass play all year, which is by far the best in the NFL. So uh, it's it's been a function of a, of an integrated defense, uh, and they're they're the zone they play really has eyes on the quarterback all the time, and so that's why I'm trying to trying to figure out how the how the Seahawks go about attacking that and uh, and try to make the Ravens pay. Well, they'll throw against zone, but it looked like to me in the stuff that I reviewed. Games that I reviewed because I try to look at games that the opponent is playing in that w- week before that they they switch to man in the red zone at least some of the time and so they've been seeing a lot of zone Seahawks have been seeing a lot of zone this year um, and Gino's done pretty well against it it's just been a matter of you know did we protect him long enough to give him three seconds to throw. And of course, in in this league, three seconds is an eternity. It's an eternity, yeah. And and so um, he's he's had some pressure, and um, but I I think that they'll do fine underneath against zone. It'll be what's challenged them all year, and that's red zone coverage, zone or man. And um, the other piece of that whole offense that doesn't get talked about enough, and when it comes to this matchup, it shouldn't get talked about much because Andrews is having such an amazing year. Mm-hmm. But no offense having a solid year. He's had some big, big plays, some, you know, more short outs that he turned into long plays, and then some deep balls. And I expect that they'll try to throw to him. If we get, you know, we're running 11 personnel, I expect that they'll try to throw to no offense. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. He's uh, he's over 14 yards a target this year, which is just absurd. That uh, it's not sustainable, but he's he's having a fantastic year. Definitely to start the uh, start the year. So it surprises me that he's only got 16 targets in seven games, um, given that kind of success. So well, is so- there something about the way that they scheme up plays that makes it? I don't know. Do, what does he do? <laughs> we lived in 12 and 13 personnel last year, mm-hmm. a lot. Because basically we were Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf for wide receivers. And so um, it helped our running game and it helped our passing game. But passing game to tight ends. Our tight end room was one of the top three or four in the in the league. It's just it was spread out among all three of them. You know, Noah Fant, Will Disley, and Colby Parkinson. And Parkinson, he's a red zone threat that they have not capitalized on. Guy's almost 6'8", right? And over uh, over 250, and he can run. So he he's he's a good high point target that they just have not taken advantage of. But so you, you mentioned 12 personnel last year. It looks like they're still playing about 1.5 tight ends per play this year. When I take when I take some of the tight end snaps and divide by the Geno Smith snaps, which I assume he's taken just about every snap at quarterback so far, uh, I, I get still about 1.5. So, so that's, that's a that's a lot of 12. That feels like not much because we ran so much 13 too. Okay. And we're not, we're not seeing almost any 13 anymore. And so it will be interesting to see if they, they try to double back and play more 13 and then just try to run the ball. Right. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and set up the pass with the run. I don't think most teams in the NFL are successful doing that. There's just a few that can seem to be able to do it each year. And, and it seems to change year to year. Most teams are using the pass to set up the run. And, and you know, that's kind of the Shanahan offense. And, um, you know, he uses that, that quick passing game and then runs behind it. And so, yeah, I, I, I do think that um, we'll see probably uh, more 11 personnel because that's what they've showed us this year more than anything. And like I say, for, for us, for Seahawks fans, it doesn't feel like much 12 personnel because we're not seeing 13 personnel. I would guess if you looked at the percentage numbers of, you know, 
how many tight ends on the field per play, it's probably 1.8 for the 2022 season versus 1.5 for this season. All right, you know, I'll take a look at that while we're while we're uh, going through this. Uh, that's interesting. I, I'm very much interested in this topic because the Ravens last year were the heaviest team in recent NFL history by a mile in terms of fullback tight end plus OL6 uh, per play on the field. They were up in the 2.35 range, and nobody had been over 1.99 since the 1999 Vikings. So wow. uh, yeah, so 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 it's it's uh, it, it, it decades probably in a relative sense since they've had a team as heavy in the NFL. But uh, that was Greg Roman and his offense, and uh, and the fact also that the Ravens didn't have much of wide receiver. So uh, a lot of that. Well, let's move on, and we got to move a little quicker. I'm sorry about this, but take us through the, the, the you take us through the tight ends. I think take us through the running back room here, and then we'll talk about some personnel things on offense. So for the first time, I think this season, besides the beginning of the first game but we lost players in the first game. We have all four of our starting um, running backs that will probably be active. It won't surprise me. There, there is some possibility that, that, um, Oh, our seventh rounder. um, Now I can't can't even remember his name. That's horrible. So uh, I remember his nickname. (laughs) So DJ, uh, DJ Dallas and um, Ken Walker, and um, Zach Charbonnet should all be uh, available and and active. McIntosh may not be, and they have they hold him in high esteem. But it may just be that they don't have enough uh, special teams play for him to be active for the game to have to have four running backs active. Um, we have kept active uh, a guy that plays a little fullback, and he's a deep depth linebacker in Nick Ballour. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we're going to probably see Nick get signed again next year. There's just so much talent that they could have active for game day. Nick is a huge locker room guy and he's solid. He's a special teams captain. He's a solid special teamer, but we use him so little regular play offense or defense that the, and we did last year. It was the same same way. We may not see him get signed again for 2024. So Devin Bush hasn't been active for a few games, and he has showed out when he has played. And it's nice to have that third inside linebacker for depth because mm-hmm. basically it's Bobby and Jordan Brooks. And but those that's uh... with the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Guys, I've shared moving. I was using this for all my meals. Now I'm working from home. Guess what? Microwaves in the other room. I'm using this for all my meals. Factor is how I get through my lunch day every day, but... They've got breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I haven't tried the breakfast ones yet, but why not? I think I might add that to my next order, but I love them for lunch. Plus, they've got new autumn fall flavors out right now for a limited time featuring seasonal veggies like cranberry, pecan chicken, and apple Dijon pork chops. And again, just like everything else, they're ready in just two minutes. They'll satisfy your fall cravings during this busy season without the hassle. So go ahead and level up with Gourmet Plus options as well. Prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccoli, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Head to factormeals.com slash ravens50 and use the code ravens50 to get 50% off. That's code ravens50 at factormeals.com slash Ravens 50 to get 50% off your factor meal today. Aaron Rodgers season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie NFL college ball and a brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at an even bigger payday. Join us at my bookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boost same gate parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. 
Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. But that's fairly remarkable that Devin Bush is on the bench now after the because I think this is still his fifth year in the NFL or is this his sixth? Is he, I, I, he, they didn't. They, they, I think it's his fifth, but they didn't okay. pick up his his fifth year, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's a that's a draft pick the Steelers really went after. They oh. traded a lot to get him at number ten, and uh, the the two Devins that year, the Devin White and Devin Bush, and, and Tampa picked up the option on Devin White, and and the Steelers, I think, pretty smartly at this point, did not pick it up on Bush. I think he was never healthy after his first season. His rookie mm-hmm. season, he looked pretty solid for a rookie. And then after that, he just didn't look right. Yeah. And he's fast. I couldn't believe his numbers at the combine. He's ridiculously yeah. quick, quicker than Bobby Wagner. And Bobby Wagner was quick for a 238 pound linebacker, super quick. So, um, but he's a little bit smaller. You know, I, I kind of thought that they signed him as the, the guy that they would. Um, spy Christian um, McCaffrey with and just say, look, we're going to play defense. You follow him wherever he goes on the field. Because another thing that he's done well is he's been solid in coverage too. Again, not many snaps, but he hasn't made any big mistakes. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. The defense really is kind of an interesting animal simply because Stop um, here for just one second. 152, 1.52 for the 22 Seahawks in terms of tight ends per play. And you said 1.5 for this what, year. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's almost the same. Then unless they have somebody who's who's a like a fullback who lines up in line, sometimes it's somebody like that. But six offensive linemen, do they no, use that a lot? No? no. Okay. So so it probably was that we ran more 11 than I realized in, mm-hmm. in, in 2022. Yeah. So – that, that's an interesting number. I, I've never seen that stat. I like that. Um, so our D line is an interesting animal because of the way it transitions. You know, we're, we're run, typical running downs. We're playing a regular three, four, mm-hmm. and, but our outside linebackers are absolutely edge players. They're not linebacker type players. They're, to, they're there to rush the passer, drop into coverage sometimes, but you know, they're there to, to set the edge as much as anything, right? On, on pet rundowns. And obviously everybody knows that they lost uh, Uchenna and Mosu. And that was a big loss because he just was a big piece of that line in terms of a unit. He understood the game that they were trying to play and played it well. And the guys could key off of what he was doing. And he was an inspiration on and off the field. So losing him was huge. Being able to pick up Frank Clark and have him kind of come in, he had a fairly seamless first game last week. And um, if he can continue to kind of ramp it up just a little bit, we probably won't miss a beat on on that position change because Mafe has just continued to grow week after yeah. week. And those two positions for us so far have been what has held up the interior defensive line. Jaron Reed has four sacks. That's insane. And good pressures on the quarterback. Um, the guy that really hasn't showed out except for pressures has been uh, Draymond Jones. And this is his first se- uh, this is his first season in this defense. Uh, Mario Edwards Jr. has done well. Uh, and the only other guy they really have that's kind of playing the position of interior defensive line is Miles Adams, which – Nobody in Baltimore knows who that is, but he's been a solid backup come in for 20%, 25% of the snaps. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're finally hearing about Pete that I tweeted about early last year was Pete has, in my opinion, has come up with a way to keep costs down and production consistent. And that is create rotations at running back and pass rusher rather than having the guy. Okay. That is a topic I absolutely love, and it's part of modern franchise management that's absolutely critical. The, the place that I love to see it done is at weak side linebacker. I think it, it it often pays to have a Mike linebacker. I think having two unicorns who you want on the field for three downs is usually you either have to way overpay for it, way over in, in terms of either cap or draft capital. 
And you really miss an opportunity for flexibility at that weak side linebacker spot because that's that's your dime guy coming in, which is usually a safety because your third best safety is always a better cover guy than your second best inside linebacker. And you bring him down in the box on those downs. You have an opportunity to put in a two down thumper. The two of those cost a third of what it would cost to have another unicorn at that spot. And that's why I don't really see the Ravens holding on to Patrick Queen next year. I think they've got their guy in Roquan, but uh, Patrick Queen will move on. And the Ravens, you know, just in, in with the realities of having to save money at positions, it's, it's a very natural position to save at. I'm, I'm intrigued by the notion of saving it on the edge. Because I've, I've I've never I've never really heard that as being something that people have advocated. Now I want rotation, I want situational pass rushers, but situational pass rushers who rush the quarterback a lot and effectively are expensive, even if they're playing half the staffs. Well, and many of them can't play the run; they can't yeah. set the edge, right? They're 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 too focused on just getting to the QB. So um, they they drafted Mafe last year, early in the draft. Um, he really has come on this year. He was coming on last year, but he just wasn't getting. You know, we're out in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> So he, in terms of the NFL landscape, so he really wasn't getting much um, press on it. Uh, and then um, Derek Hall this year. And Derek Hall's a really, in, he's a little bit shorter, super powerful, great punch. And all of these guys are quick, violent hands, great first move, great punch. So they want to go right at the defender in, in their initial step or two steps. And then they'll make a move or just bull rush them. And that was his signature in college. Derek Hall's signature was, was bull rushing. The funny part about it, it is it wasn't necessarily Mafe's, although he had some great plays bull rushing uh, offensive linemen. We're actually seeing it more. I think they're expecting him to try to dip under or swim or spin. And he's catching them up, you know, falling off their toes a little bit and just blowing them right into quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. So that's a big piece. How that translates well, for Seattle, we've had um, Daryl Taylor for a long, long time. This will be his last season of this contract. And he's, so he's playing a contract year. Um, they didn't pick up his fifth year. Um, he can be great, but he can also be one of those guys that's almost more of a situational pass rusher. And since Enchana came in, Hall, you know, last year, he played for us all last year. Hall began to shift a little bit. He began to watch the edge. And uh, not Hall, um, Taylor did. And he is playing better on the edge this year than he did last year. Um, he still has a lot of growing to do. But there's guys that have come to the Seahawks in weird ways, undrafted free agents, so forth, that can play that position and play it well where they set the edge and pressure the quarterback, mm -hmm. whether they're sack specialists or not. Pete doesn't care about that. He just wants to get the quarterback off his spot or speed the quarterback up. Um, one of the guys that nobody's talking about, he hasn't been active, I think, except for one game for any seen a few snaps is Levi Bell. He's a almost 270 pounder. He's a little over six feet. <laughs> His punch is spectacular. He's faster than any of our defensive linemen or linebackers off the ball. No question. And he can play fullback. <laughs> this, this might be the demise of Nick, Nick Ballour, right? Mm -hmm. you get this, this guy can play fullback, and he's 30 pounds heavier. Um, so we have a lot of depth at that position right now. I mean, we, have, we can rotate four guys, and both of them can play both sides, right? All four of them can play both sides. So, so is there anybody who's really a drop specialist there in terms of, of taking a lot of coverage snaps from the edge? No. And so there are guys that can do it well. Yeah. Strangely enough, um, Frank Clark dropped into coverage a couple of times last week and he looked good. I was surprised because, you know, he's he's an older guy. He's not a youngster. Um, Chenna was actually probably as good at it as any of them. And so but. Mafe has proven to actually be able to drop into coverage to play the flat. He's done that really, really well. Now, being able to drop into club coverage and play the middle of the field, that's a completely different story. Looks to I me like the guy is Derek Hall, who has 9% drops this year. He has 15 out of 165 dropped into coverage. Um, I, I, I don't see anybody. Oh, well, Anwosu had 23 during his time. 
that's not 9% because he played 283 snaps. But uh, I always look for that because the Ravens had Tyus Bowser and they've had him on the shelf the whole year. And they really missed him because he dropped he, he's dropped career into coverage 32% of the time from the edge. Wow, that's so, a lot from the yeah, end. it's a, it's a lot, and and so now they don't have anybody who's dropping particularly much, and it's it's uh, I, I just always am interested to see who, what they have. Uh, it does seem like the the Seahawks are getting a lot of compound pressures for sacks this year because they're fifth in the NFL in sacks as a team with twenty six. But but you're telling me it's a lot of moving the quarterback, a lot of a lot of second man to the ball, a lot of cleanup done there. I I think that's a big part of it. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times it's just one guy getting there while the other three guys are doing their job and giving him the, sh- the chance. Right. Okay. And, and so in some ways I do call that cleanup, you know, there, there's one guy that was designed in the rush to get there and they're getting him there and it's never necessarily, not necessarily the same guy. I don't think they have anybody with more than four sacks. Okay. And they do have they- a bunch of guys with more than one. Okay. So um, now again, a big part of that was 11 sacks against the giants. Mm-hmm. So you, you got to, take that with a grain of salt but uh that that will make a big shift in your numbers for a, yeah. uh, for eight games but um go. yeah I, I think that's been a big part of it and and again pete wanted to do this last year clint hurt our dc wanted to do this last year and he just didn't have the right people to do it he didn't have people that were quick enough that were penetrating that violent hands gonna get past my man in some way shape or form to do it and it's funny how that changes the blocking of an offensive line, right? You've got this zone blocking scheme, but if you guys got if you got guys that can get slip between, it screws up running games. It totally does, and it gives linebackers a chance to play cleanup then, because when you watch offensive linemen get beat on those zone blocking schemes, the first thing they try to do is go back to the guy that's beating them. They don't try to drop, you know, push to the next level and pick up the linebacker. Mm-hmm. And and so it's it's, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic that that is proven true. Pete talked about being able to do it and wouldn't elaborate as to how it was going to actually come true. And now, of course, he's talking about it and saying, "Yeah, looks like we got this figured out." I think this is what we wanted to do last year. So and and going forward, it looks like that's who they're drafting. That's who they're bringing in. Frank Clark and Jaron Reed both had their best seasons together in 2018. Okay, take us off ball for a moment now in terms of who's played there at uh, inside linebacker first. We know Bobby Wagner's having a big year, but uh, who, do, do they show a dime at all for at the weak side spot? So when we go to a bare front, right, that's just four guys. And and so it, it really is one edge and three defensive linemen um, in many cases. Uh, usually what they'll do is they'll bring Jamal down and let Jamal play that third linebacker spot. And he's good at doing it. He's good at going against tight ends. He'll have his toughest matchup without question in this Sunday's game against Andrews because Andrews is so good at getting open and Mm -hmm. so good at bodying up smaller players. Um, But I think his confidence is back. I think he was playing with a kind of a lack of confidence, not sure, not being sure how he had recovered from his injuries. And he's had repeated ones, right? It's kind of, it, it's the story of the Seahawks trade history. Uh-huh. Uh, it, 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 if you talk about anything that happens in Seahawks trade, the first or the second topic is how badly they screwed up on the Jamal Adams trade. And he may prove everybody to be wrong by being really strong this year. He has the capacity. What he's doing different this year than he's done in the past is he's not playing with his hair on fire. He's playing within the scheme. He's using the scheme in his, his teammates to cover parts that he might try to cover so that he is absolutely where he needs to be for his job. And I think he's thinking less, you know, he's spending less time thinking about what he needs to do and just doing it. He's just, he's playing faster because of it. He's a pure strong safety though. They don't ever try and split the field with him on the back end. From time to time, they actually do. It's the strangest thing. And, And they'll bring Julian, Julian Love, the other giant that they picked up last year up in into the, the the middle zone middle of the field and let him play up but usually he's either in the box or he's he's playing um he, he he's dropping into middle middle field coverage um it just depends on where the tight end or the running back goes 
Okay, very good. Um, let's see. Take us into the secondary. Take us around there. So, obviously, I think the world knows about Quandre Diggs. I think he's having a little bit of a um, sleeper season in that he hasn't had to do quite as much work as he's done in the past because he's got cornerbacks that can cover man. And um, at the same time, it's a transition for him to not have to think that way. And so I think that the second half of the season, we'll see more interceptions from him. We'll see more big plays from him. But the beginning of the season has had him coming up to be the guy that stops the run at five yards. There's a lot of, you know, if it got missed by the linebackers in the line, he's there at five yards to end the play on running downs. And we didn't have that much in 2022. Um, clearly, the guy's a big hitter for as small as he is. Um, but I, I think we're going to see a, a lot more in coverage plays from him that we haven't seen so far this year, just based on the fact that he's getting used to this cornerback situation um, with the cornerbacks. Uh, Julian Love has been a solid starter for us. Um, I can't say anything bad about him, but he might be the weakest link in the secondary. And um, you got to remember that you're talking about Tariq Woolen, who nobody expected to be as good as he is, still playing well. Uh, Devin Withers Witherspoon's getting all the press that anybody can get as a rookie. Mm -hmm. He's playing very well. And Trey Brown has been solid on the other side because he's playing the outside corner, right? Most of what Witherspoon has played has been corner uh, nickel. And he says, I thought he played a little nickel at Illinois. No, I don't he believe so. He didn't play any. Yeah, I, 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 I don't him believe say so. that last week. Yeah, With Witherspoon was so far and away. I loved him in the draft, and he was so far and away better than the other corners. It, uh, the only the only other guy I really liked, even close to as much, was Emmanuel Forbes because of his huge interception potential. But Witherspoon was by far the number one corner in that draft. That was all outside. He he was a uh, uh, he might he might have chased some number one receivers into the slot, that kind of thing. But now nah, he's. He's, he's too good there. Unbelievable tackler. I've noticed Bobby Wagner's having an unbelievable tackling year, which is, you know, it's not surprising, but to be a 2.6% in terms of missed tackles for the year. And then uh, Witherspoon is uh, seems to be having a fantastic uh, coverage year again. Last year, he was something, he was something like 2.6 yards per target in his last year at Illinois, but I see he has uh, um, at least an NFL passer rating against in the 50s this year. So he's been, he's been, I think every bit what the Seahawks could hope he would have been. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Um, so Tariq Woolen is a guy that most people um, underestimate because of his height. Mm -hmm. He's not the tallest guy in the world, but he's a super strong player mm -hmm. and his 20 yard split is extremely solid. So if somebody gets behind him, he might have problems, but as long as he's, you know, playing in a 20, 25 yard target area, he probably is going to be with his man. Um, and then Tariq Woolen uh, changed name to Reek Woolen. Uh, for those that <laughs> when they hear it in the broadcast, they'll know who we're talking about um, has, has been uh, different this year. And I think part of it was he didn't get much for camp. He was injured through most of camp and he didn't start the season. Right. So he's injured through that part of it. The other piece of the puzzle has been for him um, that he's had some really questionable calls. He had a call, a pass interference call that he didn't touch the guy. The help, the ball hit him in the helmet. He had not touched the receiver and the ball hit him in the helmet and they called pass interference. He's been penalized four times the last two weeks, I see. So that, uh, that bears watching here. Well, we're hearing from Pete that Pete, the only message Pete tells him is, you look spectacular. Don't do anything different. <laughs> Pay no attention to what's happened. Be what a, a great corner is, and that's you have an incredibly short memory. Go out and play your game. You will do well. And, you know, he got his first interception. Yes, yeah, so. and, and, yeah. and people were asking him, you know, gee, you had six last year. It's been seven games, no interceptions. How does that make you feel? And he's like, you know what? They come in bunches. And it's coming. So, where Jamal Adams has that really intense personality and he is absolutely a leader on this team. He gets our guys going. Rick Woolen is more of a um, Tyler Lockett approach. He's really laid back. He's pretty quiet. And um, 
but but people want to hear what he has to say. His teammates want to hear what he has to say. So in many ways, he is a leader out there just as a second year player. All right. I, I, how do you expect the the, the uh, Seahawks to line up and try and defend the Ravens in particular? And obviously, the, the, the first question comes with Lamar Jackson. Have they used a spy uh, a fair amount to, to try and stop other teams, highly mobile quarterbacks? Or, or how do you think they'll line up and try and figure that out? Well, we kind of expected that we would get a more mobile quarterback against Cleveland, and clearly that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But then what we discovered was P.J. can run. <laughs> <laughs> and and he put some yards on us. Um, I think they do plan to to spy him. It would be really surprising, as talented as he is. I mean, clearly the, the number one rushing QB in the league, mm-hmm. and has been whether he actually had the numbers or not for years. Mm-hmm. And most years he actually did have the numbers. <laughs> so um, I, I believe that they plan to spy him, but they're not talking about that at all. Sure, they wouldn't give away that ahead of the game. That's for yeah. certain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, one and, one of the reasons why it didn't work out for Jackson last week at Arizona was spies were very effectively used against him, and Jackson didn't do a good job of manipulating them. Because if you have people staying in the middle of the field, all you need to do is step out of that pocket to to trigger the rush, or step up in the pocket usually triggers them moving downhill, and you actually create space in between levels two and three, and that's where the Ravens' receiving talent is largely at tight end and people like Beckham and, and, uh, and Bateman who can hurt you there. So versus the Ravens receiving core, I think we'll see some man. Mm -hmm. I think they'll play man and then play zone in the middle of the field. So play man outside. Okay. And um, I think they have the talent to, to, to play with them that way. Um, And then we'll see off the line of scrimmage, potentially some uh, nickel blitzes, some safety blitzes where they're going to take their shots. They didn't take many shots against Cleveland. And, uh, they had one linebacker blitz. They had Jordan Brooks mm-hmm. go on, on one linebacker blitz fairly early. And he's, it was a strip sack, but typically they, they're not living in any of that stuff, right? They're not doing it all the time. So I would imagine you'll probably see, um, some five personnel on passing downs. Five, five, uh, five men on the line. So true three, four, and they'll try to drop somebody into coverage and maybe bring a nickel depending on who's in the slot or if they don't have anybody in the slot and it's a, it's a defensive end at the end of the line, let mm-hmm. the, let the, the guy on the edge, um, pick up the, 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 drop to the, cover. Tight, the tight end, yep. at least in the first, you know, five yards or first eight yards. Um, and, and that's where our, our edge players can play, right? They can play in the flat. And and that is going to be part of the puzzle, right? And when they have those guys out there, if Lamar tries to roll out, their job has been to really not allow yards outside by quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I, you know, we really haven't seen that guy that was ridiculously mobile. Um, we probably will when we get to see the Cardinals the next time we play them, Mm -hmm. but this will be our first shot at it. And I got to believe they have a little bit different game plan for it, but you know, and it's funny, Pete has an experience going up against that, that Greg Roman offense when he was, he was coaching Colin Kaepernick Mm -hmm. into being a running QB. Right. And so he had some experience going up against that and did fairly well against it. I'm sure that he's had the conversation with Clint Hurd about that idea that, we are absolutely 11 on 11 here. <laughs> we are not 11 on 10. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see just the d- different variations of, because, you know, that's Pete's thing. He loves what you love. Run one defense mm-hmm. and then make it so simple that the guys can play full speed, never have to ask themselves, what am I doing here? And um, since they started this bare front uh, three, four, trade off last year i think it was a little bit more complicated but pete's discovered that these guys are smart enough to get it to see what their job is depending on which front they're running and it's really starting to show up i mean their defense has improved week after week no question about it 
All right. Fair enough. Uh, great stuff here. Really appreciate you coming on, Dan. Um, give us, I, I don't go for score predictions. I always hate it when I'm on shows. People try and try and get me to give a score prediction, but give me a player on each side of the ball that you think matches up exceptionally well against the Ravens. One defense, one offense. Okay. Um, well, the defensive one's a no brainer. Devon Withers. <laughs> so makes sense. Because he can do everything, right? He, he could cover both ways. He could cover outside. He can blitz. He tackles well. Um, so he plays well in space. Yeah, that that's a no-brainer. On offense, believe it or not, if I had to pick one guy, I'm picking Gino. Okay. I think right. he's going to be really focused for this game. And with DK at full strength, he's going to feel like I can do anything. Believe it or not, at the beginning of the year, I think he had Gino had too many options. Because it wasn't, you know, I'm going to hit my guy in the flat or I'm going to hit a tight end five to eight yards down the field as my check down or my last route before I go to my check down, right? It was... I've got three guys that can absolutely make space in the first 15 yards and a guy that can take the top off for almost anybody, even against double coverage. And I think it was just a little bit more than he was prepared to take on game speed, you know, and, and, and it, there's a difference between practicing doing that and doing it against the team that wants to hurt you. <laughs> That's I that's it is a good question because you're seeing color and things are different, obviously. But but that was one of my questions about Geno Smith. And I honestly don't know the answer to this question. But is he a guy who is known for working through a progression quickly and and making good decisions that way? Uh, is he an easy eye guy, as I call it, who who is a, a whole field reader at some point who then narrows his focus to one? Or is he really a progression type reader? So from the beginning of last year. He was reading progressions from 2021, those three games that he started. He was reading progressions. Um, when he gets pressure, he can move off of that following along. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, and maybe this is a credit to playing behind Russell Wilson as long as he did, um, he can create. He can create with his legs. He sure. can create getting outside the pocket and make plays. And he's, he's had a number of them this year. And uh, the last touchdown to Tyler Lockett in the back of the end zone after um, sprinting out to the left and catching him at the very back of the end zone, toe drag catch. Um, he has that capability. I think he's the things are slowing down a little bit for him in terms of what he's been seeing and what his options are. And I think Pete's going to dial him back a little bit and say, don't worry about throwing the ball away. Don't worry about having to win on each play. Let's let's prove that we can do what they're going to give us. We can win with what they're going to give us. Take our shots when we get them and clean up our, our red zone offense. And, and you're going to be fine. You're not going to have to worry about this. All right, Dan, really appreciate you coming on and giving us a, a, a lot of detail across the uh, a, a entire personnel set here and uh, see the enthusiasm for this. And I, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a good game on Sunday. It's supposed to be really nice weather here in Baltimore, uh, approaching 70 degrees. So we'll have, uh, I, I think, uh, a good day to anyway be out at the stadium, which I'm looking forward to. We've had some rain here that, uh, that you guys are probably pretty used to out there. Uh, do you, you go to the games in Seattle every week? I, I don't go every week. And okay. – uh, Part of it is um, I love the atmosphere, one mm -hmm. of the best in, in the league, clearly. But you can see so much more of the game on TV. It's crazy. And, and I don't need the intensity of the crowd to be enthused by the process, as, as you might imagine. And okay. um, so and, and since I'm never going to travel with the team, well, who knows? Maybe one day I will after my daughter's out of high school. Um, it's one of those things where I'm so used to watching and seeing what I see and understanding the game as it goes along. Cause I live tweet during the game and I'm going to try to get into some more live broadcasting during the game so that um, I can kind of put out what I'm seeing 
Um, one of the pieces that I, I thought I'd mention that you didn't ask about is Pete's record in the Eastern time zone games in the 10 o'clock starts. He's crazy good right now. He's like hmm. 10 and two in his last 12 starts. And that's weird for a le- what we call a left coast team, right? Yep. Um, so th- that's, I think that's a, a, a thing that he's gotten his teams doing well. You know, they're prepared when, when they show up to play those 10 o'clock games and uh, being the parent of an athlete that's a high level athlete, when you perform makes a difference, what time of day, what mm-hmm. you're used to. And uh, so I, I think that's, that's a big plus for him. Um, I'm excited to see the Ravens play. Um, that the things that nobody expects them to do. Right. I'm really am excited to see, get, cause I think that their running game is underappreciated without Lamar and, and they just right. haven't quite dialed in how they make it work with Lamar running the ball and our running backs getting the ball, whether it's, you know, passing to them or handing off. And it's one of the things that I, I'm a little worried about. Um, the Browns put some, put some miles on us in their running game last week. Most of the Ravens running is done. I mean, they, they do, they run half the time pretty much with, but most of the Ravens running game is done when they're closing out a game. And so that fact makes it, the other team knows the run is coming. So on a, on a rate statistic basis, they're almost always worse. Let, let's, we, we need to end it here, Dan. I need you to tell, tell us where folks, where they can find your work uh, and talk football with you online. At setting the edge on X or Twitter or whatever they're calling it these days is the easiest and best way to find what I'm talking about and communicate with me. I always respond to people that reach out. So, um, yeah, um, my pod uh, is a YouTube channel uh, that I just got set up. So I'm just continuing to work on it. Uh, inspired by guys like you, Ken, who have been really cranking it out and, and completely crushing it. And uh, we have a number of guys in our market that do it very well, mm-hmm. but not many of them that are local. It's interesting. Only a few guys are local, born and raised here that, and I'm a native Washingtonian, been following along my whole life. So, All right. Very good, Dan. Really appreciate you reaching out to and, and uh, finding me to, to, to do this episode. Uh, uh, it's greatly appreciated. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I'll always get back to you very quickly. And I've tried to do about one of these per week. The ideas are coming in a little faster than that. So be a little bit patient with me in terms of, of uh, getting back to you to do the extra show. But that's how I meet new people. And I really do appreciate it. Dan, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, Ken. This was awesome. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study. 